Yeah, well, uh, by this time, I've heard so many presentations, you might think that, well, <coughs> all the bad stuff going on on the outside, all these bad ideas and bad worldviews going on, as, as Lutherans, we can have our own, we can have our own Lutheran way of thinking, way of educating, and you might think that what we're doing as Lutherans <coughs> doesn't really have any connection with what's going on out, out there. Uh, it doesn't really have much to say to that uh, other than to condemn it. And we might also think that those outside secularists wouldn't be receptive to what we have wouldn't be receptive to uh, to confessional Lutheran ideas, um, and you know on one level that's true, except for what I'm going to show you about J. G. Hammond. Um, yeah, come on in. Uh, and just about every session that I've been to touches on what Haman says or Haman addresses it in some very helpful ways. And so we'll see that as we, as we get into this. Um, so um, the other thing we're going to, I'm going to talk about is this project I've been working on with uh, John Kleinig. It's the first English translation of Haman's London writings. Um, are you familiar with John Kleinig? Great Australian Lutheran writer. Uh, I urge you to read his Grace Upon Grace, uh, for example, uh, to, to get started. He's also done the, the Concordia commentary on Leviticus and on Hebrews, and he has some other really exciting things in the works right now. But this is supreme because this work has not been in English, <coughs> and yet this is the one where Haman talks about his faith, as his conversion, his reflections on reading the Bible. And it, you're, he's getting the ideas that he's going to develop then for the rest of, of his life. But they're all here. You know, this is the introduction to Haman. This is the starting point. Again, it hasn't been uh, available in English. It will be as of next month because uh, it was finished. I'll tell you some more about the project, and it should be coming out in, in August sometime. Well, who is this? Johann Georg Hamann lived in the 18th century. And at the time, in the 18th century, and maybe even more so in the 19th century, he was quite well known and quite influential in a lot of ways that are kind of surprising. Uh, Goethe great German poet, called him the brightest mind of his day. Uh, Kierkegaard called him the greatest humorist in Christendom. And, 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 and he is, in, in ways I'll maybe get to. Get to. Uh, Walther was a big Haman fan. He quotes him several times in Der Lutheraner. But after, after that, he really fell into obscurity. Uh, people forgot who he was. Nobody studied him. Nobody read him uh, for a very long time <clears throat> until recently. And he's been rediscovered, uh, mainly because of the scholarship on postmodernism and they saw Haman, first of all, gives the best critique of the Enlightenment. 
of anybody. And that's recognized, even by the secularist. The, the idea that reason can tell you everything. Uh, we, we had the, uh, uh, the, the talk uh, starting, I pr- appreciate, uh, yeah, Pastor, uh, Pastor Richards comment on the, the errors of the false gospel of rationalism. Uh, followed by the false gospel of emotionalism. Uh, Amon basically addresses both of those. Uh, But the Enlightenment really gave, and this whole business of the age of reason, morphed in different ways into what we would recognize as modernism. We heard about Dewey and Dewey's desire to reduce everything to reason, throw out all superstition, Throw out all tradition. Throw out all re- revealed religion. Okay, this is one of the legacies of beginning with the Enlightenment, but really intensifying through the 20th century. But not only that, Haman saw where it was going. He critiques this Enlightenment rationalism and basically predicted that it would mutate into postmodernism. And he refuted that, too. Okay. And I love this quote from uh, uh, Peter Leithart. It takes a prophet to contribute to debates 200 years before they start. <laughs> and scholars are realizing things that people are wrestling with right now. Haman was dealing with those in completely fresh and illuminating and decisive ways back in the 1700s. Um, And I found that he also, as I worked through the London writings as, as, as editor, he's dealing with... Uh, theological issues of contemporary Christianity that we're just now dealing with. People questioning the atonement. People questioning authority of scripture, historical critical method. The idea of uh, creation. All of these things Haman is addressing in ways that I never thought of before. In, in, in fresh, very insightful kind of ways. And so he's been rediscovered. Um, not only that, this quote from John Betts, probably the best Haman scholar. If you, if you want to read something about Haman and his thought, um, read John Betts's book, uh, After Enlightenment. But Betts says, Haman brings us to a decidedly postmodern crossroads, at which point one can take the road of faith, which is what Haman is advocating, or one can take the road of post-modernist, postmodern unbelief, which leads to nihilism belief in nothing there's no meaning in life no value no no right and wrong no no nothing actually he shows that both modernism both rationalism and the relativism of postmodernism lead to nihilism a bit says simply put the alternative is one between Haman and postmodernity in other words, he says the only way out, the only way forward. I mean, even scholars, secular scholars are saying, yes, postmodernism, yay, yay, yay. But where can we go from here? It's a dead end. If truth is relative, what do we do? What can we do? Uh, if, if everything is just power... And Haman anticipated that too. 
If you reject this, you're going to come to, people are going to start saying that it's just a matter of who has power over who, and you know, basically the critical theory that's dominant now. Then what do you do? Because you can't really fix it. You can't really do anything about it. You're intrinsically racist or whatever. If if you're and it's a dead end. How do we go forward? A lot of scholars are saying Haman is the only one that shows a way forward. A lot of them don't realize. A lot of these secular scholars, though, what lies behind Haman insights which is his confessional Lutheran theology. Okay. And that becomes really clear when you read the the London writings, especially. So, let me tell you about him. And then we'll get into how he addresses these issues. Uh, He's from uh, Königsberg, Germany. He was he was born there, and and lived there. Uh, Immanuel Kant was another famous, m- he became much more famous uh, thinker from Königsberg, was in Prussia, uh, and Haman. He, he grew up in the church. He was baptized, confirmed, and he he was, you know, as most people were then. But he became really caught up with the Enlightenment, with reason. He was a friend of Kant, and there's a a number of other young men who were just exhilarated with the power of reason, casting down all the old ideas, casting down uh, traditional religion, the efforts to build a new religion based on reason and reason alone the name of one of Kant's books, Um, and, you know, come up with new ways of organizing society and thinking about right and wrong. And uh, even those who were Christians, in, in name at least, said, well, we need to purge Christianity of all its irrational elements. Throw out the miracles, throw out prayer, throw out the sacraments, only what we can understand. And, you know, what, what is it left? Again, higher critical method in the Bible started this way. Lib- what we would call liberal theology started with this in this way. And that was the climate. And young uh, Haman was way into it. And he was, he was, he was in, in this, in this, intellectual uh, s- circle. <coughs> now, he was different from his friends in this group uh, in, in several ways. He wasn't well-connected like they were. He, he didn't have, he's from a, a very ordinary family. His father owned a, a bathhouse. Uh, but and he didn't know what he really was interested in, uh, like a lot of liberal arts types, interested in everything. But he didn't really have a strong sense of, of purpose or vocation, and he tried various things and didn't really work out well. Uh, one of his friends, enlightenment, enlightened one of the other enlighteners. Um, uh, Baron, uh, his father though had a, a business um, in in Riga, what's now now Latvia, and so he was going to help this young man. So he gave him a job with a business, and he said, "What I need you to do is to go to London and negotiate this trade agreement." Okay, he had some scheme, and we don't know exactly what it was. But he was to go on behalf of the company and negotiate a, an agreement where they would, you know, export things from London, import things in Riga, send things back. Anyway, straightforward, this is a good opportunity for the young man. <clears throat> so he went to London, 28 years old, 
<coughs> and it was a complete failure. Yeah, we don't know exactly why. Uh, it was just a humiliating failure. We know that Haman had a speech impediment. I'm not even sure exactly what it was. He was very nervous. He did not make a good impression. He, he bungled the whole negotiation, and it was a fiasco. He was embarrassed to go back home. Stayed in London. He enjoyed London. Uh, he fell into some bad company, let us say. Uh, uh, fell into a life of, of debauchery and finally uh, he, he was staying with this friend he made and then he found out that it was part of a kind of underground homosexual uh, arrangement with other he he was freaked out by that and he got out of there as quick as he could but now he had no money no friends no self esteem no nothing um he got he stayed with a a family took him in a christian family um for for a small amount he was able to board with them but his his money was running out really quickly and it was at a low low point and at that point he picked up uh, a bible the english bible king james version and you know well i'll just read i'll read this And the law and gospel and God's word did its work. In, in, in a kind of powerful textbook way, in reading the Bible, he said, uh, you know, a lot of times when you read the Bible, we identify with the, with the good guys, with you know, David and or Moses, not the Canaanites, not the. Haman seemed to read it identifying with the bad guys. And, and he realized that God is addressing him. This is not just an interesting book, not just a historical treatise or even a collection of doctrines. God is personally addressing him in the words of Scripture. And the law came on him like a ton of bricks he, he was reading about Cain and Abel. He says, I killed my brother like this. I'm guilty of the blood of my brothers. And, and not that he literally killed him, but I mean, he was s taking all of this, speaking to him. And then the gospel, Christ's forgiveness. And he saw that even as he was reading the Old Testament. He was seeing God's grace and mercy and pointing to Christ. Uh, just read part of it. Again, this is in the London writings that's, that's coming out, first English translation. He said, the further I went in, in the Bible, the newer it became for me. The more divine was my experience of its content and effect. I forgot all my books about it. It was even a shame that I'd ever compared them to the book of God. I'd ever set them side by side, and I'd ever preferred another book to it. I found the unity of the divine will in the redemption of, of Jesus Christ, so that all history, all miracles, all the commandments and works of God converge at this central point in order to lead the human soul out of slavery, bondage, blindness, folly, and death from sin to the greatest happiness, the highest blessedness, and the reception of such good gifts whose greatness when they were revealed to us must shock us more than our own unworthiness or the possibility of making ourselves worthy of them. I recognized my own offenses in the history of the Jewish people. I read the story of my own life. Despite my great weakness, 
despite the long resistance which I had until now put up against his witness and his tender touch, the Spirit of God kept on revealing to me the mystery of divine love and the benefit of faith in our gracious only Savior more and always more. And again, in the London writings, he he has this passage where he confesses what he now believes. I confess with my heart and my best understanding that without faith in Jesus Christ, it is impossible to know God. And what a loving, unutterably good and generous being he is, whose wisdom, omnipotence, and other attributes seem to be only, as it were, instruments of his love for humanity. I confess that this preference for men, the insects of creation, belongs to the greatest depths of divine revelation. I confess that Jesus Christ was not only pleased to become a man, but also a poor and most wretched man. I confess that it is therefore impossible for us to love ourselves and our neighbor without faith in God, which his spirit produces, and the merit of the only mediator. In short, a person must be a true Christian to be a proper father, a proper child, a good citizen, a proper patriot, a good subject. Yes, a good employer and a good employee. What's that? Doctrine of vocation, of which he says some very interesting thing. Now, we can already see He's a Christian now. He's also a Lutheran Christian. And, and we'll see that even more in the things that he, that he addresses. Here's what happened next. He went back home telling his friends of his awakening to the gospel. All the insights it's giving him and the things he's realizing and the excitement and where... And his friends are appalled and shocked and disgusted. He said, he, Johan, what about reason? You've rejected reason. You're going back to those superstitions that we always used to mock and ridicule. You're giving up the cause. <clears throat> and, you know, we, we, you must return to the reason of the Enlightenment. Again, Kant was one of these friends. He said, allow us to persuade you. We will show by reason that your little, you know, nervous breakdown, okay, that's understandable, you were in a bad way. But let's bring you back to reason and reason alone. And Haman said, well, reason did not bring me to Christ, so it's unlikely to take me away from him. So he said, uh, okay, try it. So they did. They <laughs> gave him all the reasons and all the, and of course, that didn't shake him at all. But then, turnabout is fair play. Haman said, okay, now let me talk to you about your beliefs. Let me talk to you about your trust in reason. Now, in the subsequent uh, dialogue, and it started in letters, and it built, Haman wrote some short little articles, short little tracts, and they were published, they were very short, And in these writings, he he developed, like I say, a critique of the Enlightenment that scholars now are recognizing as pretty definitive. Not just the Enlightenment, but that trust in, in reason. Now... Let me just briefly, very simply, tell you what some of his, uh, his, his points were. 
Okay, reason does not yield certainty. Now, one of the things about reason, why people were so excited about it at that time, is that this will give us certainty. What we can know by reason, that's certain. And this quest for certainty, you still see that today. Uh, um, a lot of atheists talk this way, and agnostics. They'll say, well, if I could only be certain there is a God, then I could believe. And an agnostic says, I know there's a reason to believe, but there's a reason not to believe. I've got to be certain. Otherwise, I won't. I'll, I'll just neither believe nor not, nor not, nor, uh, nor uh, I'll neither believe in God or not believe in God. I've got to be certain. And uh, have you noticed that? Have you come across that? The new atheist, they talk that way. Certainty, certainty, certainty. Haman shows that reason does not and cannot give certainty. In fact, what this trust in reason does is make a person uncertain about everything. It creates not certainty but skepticism. And sure, I mean, even the Enlightenment, you know, they're told, uh, uh, you know, they look at this institution, they're skeptical about it. They have another idea, they're skeptical about it. They're skeptical, they're skeptical about everything, not just religion, but everything. Because they, their, their desire for certainty, uh, it can't be. Uh, Haman points out, okay, all of you, my enlightenment friends, notice all of the different kinds of, theo of philosophy that you all and you have been coming up with and that you've been buying into, all of which claims to be based on reason. Okay, Descartes. Well, he begins by skepticism. Okay, everything you can be skeptical of. What is the one thing that you can't be that you can be certain of. And the only thing he was, he came down to was, I think, therefore I am. His own existence is the only thing you can really be certain of. But then to be skeptical of everything else, what kind of philosophy is it that says you can't know anything? And then, um, not just that, okay, Descartes had one. Leibniz had a philosophy based on reason and reason alone. Well, Spinoza has one based on reason and reason alone. And on and on and on, and they're all totally different and incompatible with each other. If you just believe in reason, what you're going to end up with is skepticism of everything, and then you're going to be skeptical of reason too, and you're going to end with relativism. And, does that sound familiar? That becomes postmodernism, right? And that's exactly what happened. He predicted the whole course of modern philosophy. Uh, another problem is that reason reduces reality to abstractions. Okay, we live in a world of you know, flesh and blood people, but when you start turning everything into reason, you have humanity. Okay, humani well, that's an abstraction as opposed to your, your neighbor right beside you. You know, you talk about all of these abstract ideals which takes you farther and farther away from reality. Um, Haman I talked about and this 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 came up uh, in one of the the, uh, the talks. Um, he was quite open to science, uh, to the new empirical science. He said we, we basically know things through our senses. 
and this ties into his theology of creation later on, and of the sacraments, and, and of, of, of the incarnation of Christ. As human beings, we're, we're physical beings, and so we know by physical things. Of course, even science will take physical evidence and then create a model for it, a scientific law or a model to account for all of the uh, empirical evidence. Okay, now, now that's where you start getting differences even in science because there are different models and this new evidence comes in, you have to create new models. Anyway, that's, that's just how, how it works. Uh, but he, Haman really worried about create about abstraction and of course as we'll see he says people even turn God into an abstraction the most real of re <laughs> I mean that's the ultimate reality to use another abstraction uh, but I mean God is a person he's real he's the basis of everything else that's real but we turn him into just an idea okay and and that as we'll see, can get us into trouble. And then his other point, I mean, he had other, many other points, but he also says that reason detaches the thinker from reality. You know, the Enlightenment wanted a, a religion based on reason alone, so they came up with deism. And they picture God as someone outside the universe looking down from a far distance on what he made, but he's letting it just run. Miracles, God intervening to say something, that's not rational, the, the Enlightenment said. Uh, people praying to God and God changing things, that's, that's, that's not in accord with reason. No, there is a God, they admitted that, but he's a detached God. And of course, sometimes Christians think in those terms. I read a lot about... Uh, well, our, our sermon about suffering uh, that uh, Pastor uh, Murray gave. It was a great message. But we often think of God as being way out there looking down on, on all the suffering of the world. But, I mean, the assumption is, that, is a deist one, that God is detached, whereas Christianity, that God came into the suffering world. He came into this Christ. He bore the sins of and sorrows of the world and he's certainly not doing nothing about it he's taking them into himself and anyway completely different way of looking but it's easy for us post enlightenment even christians to think in terms of that god of, of deism well he says the rationalist thinkers are doing the same thing only they're putting themselves in the role of a not just a God, but a deistic God. When you think you can understand everything objectively, rationally, you're detaching yourself from it. And you're trying to study it from a distance. But you're a part of the world. You can't understand the world by abstracting yourself from it. You can't understand human beings in, in a, by detaching yourself and looking at how human beings are. You are a human being. And to really understand something, you've got to, you can't detach yourself from it. You have to be in, in the midst of it. And you have to know in, in that way. Anyway, he concludes and shows that reason requires faith. Now, Haman wasn't opposed to reason. Uh, he was trying to find a basis for reason. And I'll show you how he did that. But he says, you, you're attacking my faith because I'm not, there's not certain, there's not evidence for... He says, reason requires faith. Science requires faith. You need faith in uh, the... In the evidence that comes into you that you're processing. You need faith in your, in your reasoning. You need faith that what goes on in your mind applies to what's going on in the world. 
you, you need faith in the people, you're, the authorities you're citing. You need faith in each of your premises if you have a logical argument. And he shows definitively in a very sophisticated way that yeah, re- you ha- to have reason, you, you've got to be open to, 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 to faith. Now, Kant pushed reason about as far as anybody could in the Enlightenment. And then he started, like I said, trying to apply reason to reason itself. And he came up with this classic book now, Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. Pure Reason. Now, this was, some call it the pinnacle of, it, of Enlightenment philosophy, but it was also the beginning of, of postmodern philosophy because Kant said that what happens the mind organizes the sense impressions we get data from the outside world of our senses but it takes our mind to actively shape it and to create models and we have these innate categories that we use of color and shape and that to to perceive what we perceive but it's the work of the mind. We create mental models according to our own categories. Um, yeah, uh, Dylan uh, Thomas w- w- g- gave a great definition of truth. Okay, truth is when, uh, I mean, knowing truth is where we make our minds correspond to the outside reality that we are dealing with. There's reality, okay, to, to understand it, to know it, we uh, make our minds conform to that. And he showed that's what you do in science, that's what you do in biblical theology. We find truths of the scripture and we, in believing in that, we submit our minds to that outside truth. Right. Kant, in so many words, directly talked about that, and he said, no, it's the opposite. We, we've always thought in those terms, but really, we have to make reality fit the way our minds work. And he called this the uh, Copernican revolution in philosophy. Uh, you know, just like people used to think the earth was the center of the world, that's the Ptolemaic view. The Copernican revolution, no, it's not the center. You know, the sun is the center, we're all going around it. He claimed to do the same thing. Uh, but actually, I think it's a reversion from Copernicus to a Ptolemaic view because it makes the self the center. It's like making the earth the center. And not, it makes you the center. We're all the center. And the idea then, well, Kant didn't go this far, but Bahaman says what it does. Well, let me finish with Kant. He also concludes, we can't know things in themselves. Only the phenomena. Only things as we perceive them, only what our mind perceives. Okay. Now, Haman wrote, the, in response to Kant's critique of pure reason, a meta-critique of pure reason. Now, Haman, have you heard the, wor- the term meta? Uh, yeah, that's post, become a postmodern term. Uh, a meta, a... a uh, novel about novels. That's metafiction. Or a piece of music about music. And uh, most modern, oh, that's so meta. That's so meta. Uh, actually, Common came up with that term. <laughs> and you look up the etymology of it, and it goes back to his meta critique. Well, so it's a critique of a critique, it's a criticism of a criticism. 
Okay, so that's why it's a meta critique. <coughs> so he says, Kant, you know, my good friend, you're making everything unknowable. You're even going further than the, than the rationalist. Now we can't know anything. And yet what, what good is a system of thought that concludes we can't know anything? And, and he said, now, this is something, you're reading the London writings, which I hope you will. Uh, he, he comes into these insights. This is in biblical meditation, basically his notes on reading the Bible straight through. He gets to the part in Daniel about the wise men could not interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. You know, Nebuchadnezzar, okay, what did I dream? But, 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 you know, they were, they were tongue-tied, and they couldn't do it. And Daniel was given, you know, wisdom from, from, from the Lord, and he could do it. But his thoughts on Daniel, look what he says. Is, no matter how far all human ability extends, these are the limits that are set for the greatest minds. Great mind like Kant. To discover means to construct. Notice, what's the principle of postmodernism? Constructivism. The postmodernists say, we don't discover truth, we construct truth. We don't discover right and wrong, we construct right and wrong. Everything is a construction of the mind. Haman is seeing where this is going, even to the point of anticipating the technical jargon that they're going to be using. To discover means to construct. And then all that we can do, you know, under this mindset, is to interpret our own dreams and the dreams of others. He just summed up all of postmodern criticism, postmodern literary theory, postmodernist practice, because all you have is what your dream, your own dreams. There's no connection inside the world. Or you can interpret the dreams of others, interpret a work of literature like a dream with no reference to any reality outside it. Uh, the other thing, he says, Kant problematizes ordinary experiences. So, okay, human beings do things, you know, every day. You wake up, you get dressed, you have breakfast, you go to work, you come back, you walk the dog, you go to the store, buy some, some food. You, you, with, with Kant's system, you know, we can't know anything. It, it makes everything that we do, ordinary experience, into a problem that, well, you're not really walking the dog. You know, you, and, and he says any system that has no room for ordinary life, it's worthless. Still today, you see this with uh, critical theory. Not just critical race theory, but cr the critical theory in the academic world applies to everything. Everything is just a matter of oppression and power, and one group exercising oppressive power over somebody else. So... Uh, let's see, use my example. Okay, you, you, you get up, drink a cup of coffee. Well, that coffee, that came from oppressed peasants in Nicaragua, and, you're, and a lot of people, they really, it's paralyzing. They, they don't let them, everything becomes a political act where you, you feel guilty about whatever you're doing. You, uh, you walk the dog. Look what you're doing, you're oppressing animals. That animal, that dog, who are you? You have him ch on a leash. You have him bound and chained, making him do what you want. This is the way human being. Yeah. He goes on and on. And everything from the clothes you wear to, you know, getting in the car. Well, well gasoline, that destroys the environment. You shouldn't do that. You can't do this. You shouldn't do this, 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 this. And everything becomes... A problem. Everything becomes a matter for 
for political guilt, right? And Haman said, you know, any way of thinking that makes ordinary life a problem isn't good for much. Then the other thing that he says in his critique of, of Kant is that Kant ignores language. Okay, Kant was trying to cr create, in this case he was constructing it, a way to have total certainty to think about reason and every, but he ignores language. Now, this becomes one of Haman's big contributions to, uh, to the field of, theology, of uh, philosophy, although it's been taken different, different ways. He says, reason, well, that's a quotation. One point he said, reason is language. When you're trying to think about something and analyzing it, you're using language. And language carries with it history and tradition. Language carries with it the whole history of, 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 of the culture. And when you take a word and look at the history of the word and how it's changed, you really see how that's true. It's a collective creation of a people. You can't just make up words, although again, a post or critical theorists want to do that, uh, make up different pronouns and different this and that to try in their desperation to be pure. Uh, they're very moralistic, even though they don't believe in traditional morality. But <clears throat> when we use language, every use of language is a use of um, tradition in human history. Otherwise, language means nothing. And so the very effort to speak, the very effort to write philosophy, the very effort to say, oh, we'll get rid of all traditions, and those, they're using tradition because it's embedded in the language. Now, this was what became known as the linguistic turn in philosophy. But it's interesting that it was taken in different ways. Uh, Haman was the first to do this. And in the history of philosophy, they'll talk about uh, focus on, on language. Uh, and they'll look at uh, uh, various writers. Uh, and often they, they ignore Haman or skip right over him, but Haman was already the first to do this. Now, it took several, a couple different ways. You had the, what are called the uh, uh, linguistic philosophers. And they are very modernist. And when I was in college, uh, back in the 60s, this is in philosophy where this is what was, doing. in fact, the analytical strain of philosophy is still kind of this way. And they said, well, okay, yeah, language is everything. So every philosophical problem is just a matter of words. All the big issues, free will or determinism, just a confusion about words. Uh, is there a God? Well, that's a confusion about words. And they say everything is, you know, just words. And they take philosophical statements apart and show that, well, it's just a word game. You know, we, we think it's real because it's language, so it has meaning to us, but in actuality, it's just words. Now, the postmodernists take it further, and they talk about the prison house of language. Okay, they'll say, yes, it's just, it's, it's language, and language is how the oppressors keep everyone in line, and we're all in a prison house of language. It's a prison but we can't escape it, and th they go that way. They, were, they had no basis for language. Haman, though, does. And he wrote about the connection between human language, knowledge, and the word of God. 
God has a language. He spoke in Genesis. God, he spoke and things came into existence. He spoke the universe into existence. And so the universe has qualities of, of language still. And knowing them inv- involves kind of understanding the language. And, and modern science, far beyond what he had. I mean, DNA is a, is a language, right? And almost all of the scientific laws, if you're going to call them that, turn out to be a kind of language. And uh, so our language, we also have language. We're made in the image of God. I think that's a big part of what that is. And so we can communicate with others. We can share with others. We can be tied to other people through language. And of course, and that's what God does with his language in the word of God, in scripture, in Christ. But in far as these other Things like reason, notice, you know, John 1, you know, in the beginning was the Word. The look, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And apart from him, nothing was made that was made. And by him, you know, that, that text, the Logos, the Word, and the Word was Christ. And it's, it's the... God the Son, and it's and, and 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 for Greek philosophy, the Logos is the organizing principle of everything, and this is where we get the word logic. It comes from the word Logos, and logic properly is finding the Logos, finding the 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 word, finding the truth in whatever it is. And you cannot know anything, Haman says, really without the Logos. And then he takes that pretty far, really without faith in the Logos. This is very sophisticated, very technical, you might say. But Haman, in our, in our book, London Writings, uh, uh, John Kleinig quotes, in a letter to Lindner, this was, one of his good friends, uh, Haman claimed that in a spiritual life he was nourished by three books. The Bible, the hymnal, that's liturgical text, and Luther's small catechism. Uh, came across one place where he says, basically, my whole thought, it's all in Luther's catechism. Okay. And again, you have the word of God, you have um, faith, you have creation, uh, you have, uh, you know, vocation. You have it's all the things that he, he delves in, into. Let me tell you about the London writings. Um, I was in Australia. Our, our daughter lives there. She's married to a professor at the Lutheran Seminary there. Good friends of Klein, John Klein. And I had gotten to know him, uh, too. Anyway, we're over there. Basically, client, he said, you've got to read this. And he gave me this, uh, put me onto this book by uh, John Betts on, on, on Hama. And it, it blew me away. And uh, Kleinig had been reading Hama since he was in the university. And he was actually a German major originally. He'd always been interested in, in Hama. And he, he told me, you can't really read Hama except in German. You just can't. And, uh, and and so anyway, John Betts, who does read German, this is a great, Im- important book about his rediscovery. So I was excited about it. I put it on my friend George Streeter. I told him to read Betts' book, and Streeter was blown away by it. Now, S- George Streeter runs Ballast Press, which is a, a micro-publisher it's pretty much George. That's about it. He's the one that brought back Vingren's Luther on Vocation. He published that uh, after it had gone out of print. And then he brought back uh, Adolf Kaberly's Quest for Holiness. 
and I think there are a couple others. That, what George liked it is to find Lutheran classics and bring them back into print. But George had the idea of there needs to be a translation of the London writings. So he offered to commission Dr. Kleinig to make a translation. John Kleinig, really good in German, he can read it, uh, and to translate it. And, and I is the editor, which means um, as, as John was sending things he translated, I would give him feedback on it. And I'd say, well, this really isn't very clear. Could you, you know, what, is, what do you mean by this? Or uh, the sentence is so long, you know, German, these long paragraph long sentences with a verb at the end. And sometimes translators translate into English. You can do that with German. You can't do it with English. And uh, so, but some of it, you know, was, so I would say, well, look, okay, how about, well, if we divide this up into, you know, three sentences. Uh, and anyway, so I, I helped him put, put it in, in good, good English the best I could. Then, then the biggest task for, as an editor, I, since it's micro publisher, I had to turn, when I was finally in, I had to turn, basically build the book. Uh, I had to set it into type. I had to learn InDesign typesetting software, which is hard. And it was a new, <laughs> totally new thing that I had to learn. Uh, but anyway, it was, it was enjoyable. It got me to really have to read everything really closely they came up with. And then I did the indexes, the scripture index, which is vast, and the, uh, uh, the, the subject index. So that, but the thing is, London writing is Haman's own account of his spiritual awakening, his theological convictions, and their applications. And the thing about it, it's written in a direct personal style, unlike his later writings. Okay, Haman is hard to read. Not because he uses jargon like postmodernists do. Uh, but, you know, one of the things as an English, English major here that you really appreciate with the Enlightenment, one of the good things about it, they have really clear writing. If you read Milton's prose, Oh, it's beautiful, but it's complicated, and you have to read it and reread it. And you get to Dryden, other people, and say, say, it is clear as a bell. And this ideal of clarity in writing was a great thing, but it came out of the enlightenment desire for clarity and certainty and resolve all that. Haman said, you're using a clear style, which creates the illusion that you know what you're talking about. In reality, though, truth isn't as clear as you seem to be, as you're making it. So he wrote in a very, it, it, it's, it's kind of comical, it's kind of funny sometimes, it's, it's elusive, he's alluding to all kinds of different things. It's very unique and very uh, different. <laughs> And it's really, I mean, it's worth mastering, but, you know, modern readers, what is he, what is he saying? This doesn't have that problem. He wasn't writing it for publication. He was writing it for, for himself and a few good friends. It's direct, it's personal, and he lays out what he has to say. And as such, it's the best introduction to Haman. Basically, since he touches on things that he's going to get into later. Now, here's what's in the London writings. First one on the interpretation of sacred scripture. It's only about two pages long, and yet it's earth-shattering. It says, scripture is, okay, God has written a book. The Bible is the book that God has written. And it's God's language addressed to us personally. And anyway, it's a, it's a very Lutheran exposition of the word as a means of grace, which we 
we have, and I think sometimes we, we, we neglect that, but it's very short on the interpretation of the sacred. That's how he starts. Then the biblical meditations of a Christian. These are the notes he took as he was reading the Bible. It amounts to a commentary on the whole Bible. Okay, now this, this goes on for about 300 pages. Okay, most of the are very short, not this. But my goodness, you read this, and it, it, the, the, the insights he has into Scripture and the way he applies them, and, and to see how he sees Christ in Scripture, you know, that's a, a Lutheran principle, but you, we don't always see it. But he's writing, some of his most incredible insights are coming from parts of the Bible that are most of us find really obscure. You know, Leviticus. Okay, well, okay, all those laws that aren't valid anymore. Uh, see what Haman does with them. And it's just amazing. Anyway, this is the heart and soul of the London writings. Now, most people would consider this next one to be the heart and soul, thoughts on the course of my life, and maybe it is too. This tells about his, his, his life, kind of what I described to you, uh, but especially then what happened to him once he started reading the Bible. It's usually called his conversion. Uh, John says, well, you know, he, he was a Lutheran before. He was baptized. He was confirmed. You know, what it was was more of a, 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 an awakening, an awakening of his faith. Uh, anyway, and it's very moving, and it's very personal, and you feel sorry for the guy. I mean, the first part, he just, you know, filled with self-loathing, and oh, no good, and I can't ever get anything. But then to see what happens when, 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 when Christ gets a hold of him. Then he has a writing, Thoughts on Church Hymns. Thoughts on Church Hymns. Uh, by the way, the first thing he did once he was converted is he found a Lutheran church in London. There was a German Lutheran church mainly serving, you know, immigrants or business people who were, who were there. And he went to confession and absolution, received the sacrament. And he writes a lot about baptism and the Lord's Supper. Anyway, but the hymns, these are the Lutheran hymns, the, the chorale. Some of them we sing. Some of them are in our, 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 our hymnal. Others, I've never, they aren't in the hymnal, but they should be. Uh, those of you, that would be a good thing. When you read this, you'll read some of these hymns and say, ooh, we've got to put this into, into music. Uh, and John is translating those, those hymns, too. Um, anyway, and this incredible uh, works of devotion. And he has an essay on Deuteronomy 20 and Romans 10, uh, fragments. He says, our perception is in fragments. Our knowledge is in fragments. We go through the day, we see this, and then we think that, we think that, we read this, we read this. It's fragments. And, and, and then he, he does some things with uh, the feeding of the 5,000, how how Jesus uh, feeds the people and then gathers up the fragments. Is that how Jesus gathers up the fragments of, of our lives and thoughts? Uh, but in that, he gets into a lot of the ideas that he's going to, to develop later. Then he has meditation on Newton's study on prophecies. This isn't Sir Isaac Newton, the scientist, not John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. It's Thomas Newton, who was a Theolo Anglican theologian, wrote a book on, on prophecies. And he, said. and he has further thoughts on the course of my life. What happened afterwards? And it was really sad. He had, had planned on marrying the sister of one of those Enlightenment friends. And because he became a Christian and so, <laughs> so seriously, the friend, the brother canceled he wouldn't he, he wouldn't let the marriage go forward and you know the the poor woman too 
She had no say in it. Now here you have these enlightenment, these enlightened people, and you see how they treat others. But anyway, this is a heartbreaking thing, obviously, for Haman. Uh, he tells about it, but it doesn't shake his faith. Uh, and then finally it ends with prayer, which is uh, several pages of what he's praying for. And he uses this in his devotions, apparently throughout his life. And it's a really striking model of prayer, which includes uh, the Lord's Prayer, of course. And, and uh, Anyway, so that's the London Writings. Contribution to theology of his own. He's, he has this idea of the condescension of the Holy Trinity. Okay, we know how the, the Son... In Philippians, you know, he emptied himself, his glory. He, he emptied himself and became a man like us and suffered and died. Haman says, you see something similar with the other members of the Trinity. The father condescends, that means kind of lowers himself so that we can understand him. The father condescend in his creation god doesn't just create you know the glorious beauties of nature he creates you know bugs and dirt and i mean things that might repulse us but god in his glory condescends in his creation but then you know well how's the holy spirit condescend he, he comes to us in the lowly way in Scripture. And he sees the Bible as the Holy Spirit coming down to us. There are lots of applications of this. Uh, I'll touch on these. Now, let me just quickly, uh, some of the things he has to say to contemporary Christianity, higher criticism, uh, uh, disbelief in the actual historical understanding of the word. Is over the one sin against the spiritual religion? He's accommodated and lowered himself as much as possible to human inclinations and notion. I mean, peop- the, the criticisms that people were making of scripture, oh, it's vulgar, and oh, it has all these things. What do they do? Uh, you know, the mandrake roots, and, you know, wh- and, and other criticism. This is the, where higher criticism was just starting. And the very weakness in their mind of, of scripture, Haman shows, this is the part of the condescension of the Holy Spirit. It's very similar to the condescension in the incarnation of the Son of God and what God done in creation. Uh, uh, I was talking to uh, Pastor Boyle, who was telling me that this new book on the history of the higher critical method, and it was focusing on this one 18th century person who's really the key to it. And at the end of this book, it says, well, of course, Haman completely dismantled this guy's entire arguments for doing it. And again, another good application, modern application of him. They say, oh, well, God, that's not righteous for God to, uh, you know, kill his son for us that would be divine child abuse and that missing the trinity but he gets the idea that god was willing to sacrifice even his righteousness to save us i mean he is a way of taking the criticisms and turning them around to make a point of biblical christianity uh, pro-life issues. He said the, the devil is always, he's talking about the, the, bir- the uh, uh, you know, the, the seed of the woman with Adam and Eve. And now the promise was going, uh, the Savior would come through the seed of the woman. He says the devil was afraid of that. And this fear moved him to use so many strategies to divert humans from reproduction and to murder children. This is why the devil hates babies. He doesn't want babies to be born. He wants people to have sex, but no babies. You got to not let that happen. This is why we have abortion, because the devil hates children. Anyway, uh, sex and gender, he talks about 
homosexuality, which was a big thing with Frederick the Great of Prussia. And he, he talks about marriage. He says, once that happened, this is bond between heaven and earth. It's a sign it, we're going to have sterility, decadence, and cultural decline. Because this of, of the union of differences is so fundamental to so much. Well, I, I, for devotional reading, there's just so much. He comes to us when we need him as if he needed us. And again, these are things that would just sort of knock you out. I don't have time to get into these, but uh, I hope that you maybe will uh, get the London Writings, uh, buy it, ask your libraries to buy it. Not only those of you on faculties, but ask your public libraries to buy it because this is an important work in, contempor- in, in, in the fields of, of philosophy, the history of ideas. Uh, review it. Write a review on Amazon. And again, we want to spread the word about this book, that it's available now and all the things that it addresses. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I wish we had time for questions.